Hi there, it's uh, Russell. Welcome to the Reading Fabricator. And today I'm going to talk about a book that is highly acclaimed and was commercially successful. Published in 1993, it is the memoir Girl Interrupted by Susanna Kaysen. Now, um, I read this book like two, three months ago, but and I've just been sitting on it. I just didn't do a review of it at the time. I just kept on thinking about it and thinking about it. And just just left it aside, moved on to other things. And that's not to, that's not to say it's a bad book. It's just at the time I didn't know what to think of it. And it's a whole new experience for me reading sort of memoirs. Uh, the only other memoir I've read is, I think, Every Love Story or Every Ghost Story is a Love Story or something along those lines, which was about the life of David Foster Wallace. Um, uh, not a bad book either, but I just don't really... Yeah, memoirs are a bit iffy for me. Another one, another one I'm trying to read is American Prometheus, which is about uh, J. Robert Oppenheimer, of all things, and that's a big, hefty book. This is referred to as a memoir, but I prefer to think of it as more as a series of vignettes, a series of episodes. You could read, you could flip to any uh, section in this book, read that chapter, and most of these chapters are actually quite short. You could read that chapter and just put it down and the chapter will just stay with you sort of thing. It's one of those ones where it can be its own separate thing, but it's also connected to everything else in the book as well. So it's that, that's how I prefer to think of it. So it's, it's quite well structured, uh, a sort of a non-linear narrative. And it talks about the 18 months that Susanna Kaysen spent at the very famous McLean Hospital back in 1967. So 1967 through to the end of 68, uh, she was at this hospital, which is notoriously famous for the people the people that have stayed there. I mean, you had mathematician John Nash. Uh, most of you would know him from uh, Russell Crowe's portrayal in A Beautiful Mind. You had the musicians James Taylor and Ray Charles. You had the poet Sylvia Plath. Uh, I've got a couple of her books. I've got Ariel and The Bell Jar. And then you also have the late, great David Foster Wallace, who everyone would know from Infinite Chess. So, yeah, big reputation. This, this hospital's been around for a long, long time. Um, in regards to Sylvia Plath, I think there's a bit of a connection here. I think I, I think of three authors, the, uh, the trilogy, basically, when it comes to uh, mental health books. Uh, three female authors. So the first one is Susanna Kaysen with Girl Interrupted. The second one is Sylvia Plath with The Bell Jar. And the third one is, I think it's Elizabeth Wurzel's uh, Prozac Nation. I have all three. Um, and I've always been meaning to read Prozac Nation, but it, it's a big, hefty book. It's, it looks like a lot. And um, I don't know if I can really have the time or find the time to be able to invest myself into that much. What I consider to be almost self-loathing of all things, even though it's might not even be about that. I'm probably I'm just I'm just speculating here, but I've always been meaning to get around to the Belgium. I've read a couple of poems of Ariel from Sylvia Plath, and they're they're pretty good work. She'll always be remembered as a poet first, and I think a writer second. Uh, even though I've heard the the Belgium is quite a phenomenal piece of work, one that will be remembered from the 20th century. So as I said before, the book is a series of episodes in a non-linear fashion detailing the 18 months she spent in this hospital, particularly around the counterculture movement of the 1960s. So that's that's always going on in the background while all this is happening. So it's a really a fascinating time. As for the book itself, I was pretty furious when I got this because the, uh, the books that I received came in a parcel that was completely water damaged. I mean, that's that's just ruined there. I must ask for a refund, but I didn't end up doing it because it's still, it's still eminently readable. You can read it. It just looks terrible. So that was, I was pretty furious when I came out. So the condition is absolutely ruined, but um, yeah. So it starts with, uh, basically what happens is she swallows a shitload of aspirin pills, downs it with alcohol, and ends up getting in the hospital, getting her stomach pumped, and then she's sent to see a, so I can't remember if it's a psychiatrist or just a doctor, a friend of the family, and uh, he convinces her to get in a taxi and head to McLean Hospital. And she unwittingly signs her life away to be at this hospital for a prolonged period of time. Initially, it was supposed to be a couple of weeks, but yeah, as I said before, it stretches to 18 months. So she's um, stuck there for 18 months, even though she probably most likely doesn't have any mental health issues, maybe a little bit of a depressive episode, if, not, if anything, but she's diagnosed as having borderline personality disorder, which is something that's more like five times more common in women than men. When she gets to this hospital, she meets the head nurse, Valerie, which is She's a very kindly person. A lot of all the patients that are there on this ward look up to her. She's um, a very kindred spirit. And she's put in a room with someone by the name of Georgina Tuscan. Uh, so she's placed with her. And Georgina and Susanna are considered to be the two healthiest people on the ward. 
um, Georgina is a schizophrenic and she had the, her first episode happen when she was in a movie theatre where as she was watching the movie suddenly she felt this darkness come upon her and it absolutely freaked her the fuck out and from then on she had the, these multiple episodes but she seems to have it under wraps a little bit she's yeah she's definitely at least based on what I read in the book she's one of the more healthier people that's that's her that's staying as a resident other characters in the book is this girl by the name of Polly Clark, also schizophrenic. She's known for having massive, severe scarring all along her body. She did this by setting fire to herself, and uh, she she has she gets a, quite a bit of respect from a lot of the patients on the ward there who, who look up to her and give her yeah. Just as I said before, they give her this this amount of res respect due to her being able to do that to herself. Um, another one is. Daisy, uh, this girl who spends most of her time in her room and she eats nothing but chicken and she's addicted to laxatives. Uh, unfortunately, she comes to a bad end sometime, at some point during the book. She's not a major character in it. You have uh, Cynthia, who's a severe depressive and receives weekly electroconvulsive therapy. You have um, probably the saddest part for me was this girl by name, Alice. And for the first month that she's there, she's uh, she's quite withdrawn. She doesn't appear to be uh, what it, the term, I guess, would be called cra crazy. But after a month, she suffers this massive, and I'm talking massive, psychotic breakdown, and she's sent to the uh, maximum security ward. The girls all get signed out to go across to see, go to the cross to the maximum security ward to see her. And when they get to, I guess, I guess you refer to it as her room, it was more like a cell. Uh, they see that she's covered all the walls in feces and she's just not really making much sense. And the, it, it freaks a few of them out and um, I found that to be quite a sad moment in the book. Uh, so yeah, that's that's really the bad side to things when it comes to this sort of thing, like mental health especially. It's a very, very tricky subject to get involved in. Um, in terms of staff, you have uh, Ma McWeeny, Miss, M Miss McWeeny, who's the uh, evening nurse. Uh, she doesn't... Uh, get as much respect as the as Valerie. Uh, the girls don't look kindly to her. You've got Dr. Wick, who is the head psychiatrist, and then you have Melvin, who is the therapist assigned to Susanna Kaysen. Um, but the big character, the big one in this book, the one that everyone will remember it for, especially if you've seen the movie, which I guarantee 90% more people have seen the movie compared to reading the book, is a girl by the name of Lisa Rowe who is a sociopath and she seems to take a lot of pride in being the only sociopath on the ward. At least until another girl comes along, who also is called Lisa. She goes by Lisa Cody, who's a former drug addict. And this Lisa Cody always looks up to the other Lisa. You know, she's always following her around doing the same thing. She always talks about how, you know, she, she, was, she did this as well, so she's just like her. And it pisses off Lisa Rose so much. Um, eventually, Lisa Cody escapes and ends up back on the streets. And uh, Lisa Rowe herself is a m massive proponent for escaping the war. She escapes multiple times throughout the book and there's talks of her escaping before the book and probably even after the book. Um, during one of her escapes, uh, she's gone for a while, but when she comes back, she goes up to all the girls and with a gleeful look on her face, she says that she came across Lisa Cody and says that she's back on drugs. And she seemed quite happy about it. Uh, so there is a bit of a sociopathic tendency to her, though maybe it might just be an, a young age thing. I'm not, I'm not quite sure, you know, uh, uh, at the time, you know, uh, a lot of what would be considered normal or just growing up behaviour was considered a mental health deficiency. So, I mean, we've grown a lot in society since then. Um, but needless to say, at the time, she was considered a sociopath. And, uh, yeah, she, with glee, she said that this girl had resorted to going back to drugs. The final girl is a, a girl by Anna Tori who comes from Mexico, and she's a drug addict as well. And she gets ripped out of the ward not long after her stay and gets taken back to Mexico where she claims that she will fall back into the wrong crowd again. So you got a whole lot of fascinating characters here. I, I, I truly do think that Lisa Rowe, the main Lisa, is um, the most fascinating character in the book. I mean, she she takes pride in hurting people, but she can also be quite kindly as well. Uh, she she appears to never sleep, and she appears to never eat either. But during the late hours, when everyone else is asleep, she'll just sit there watching TV, doing her own thing, and she'll get up and make hot chocolate for the staff type thing. So she seems to be a whole lot nicer at night time, a bit, bit more subdued, you know? And, um, yeah... I think there's a lot more to her than meets the eye. So it's a very fascinating reading a book like this, which is mostly, yeah, as I said before, vignettes, episodes. You get almost just a little peek into these characters' lives, and you want to find out more, but you can't, because as I said before, this is a, this is Susanna's view of the world. This is how Susanna, Susanna viewed them. 
what I found absolutely fascinating though was that the it is a spoiler, but at the very end of the book, when she does get out after her 18 months stay, and this is years later down the track, she's still friends with Georgina. They, they remained friends for a very long time, but but she went she was walking past the subway and she came across Lisa, who was also out, and she had a, a kid with her. And she, they had a conversation as well. It's a wonderful conversation. It's, um, I think this is the highlight of the book actually for me, which was their re, uh, their yeah, just their reintroduction, their meeting after so many years, and just seeing how they talk, how they converse now that they're older and more, and out of a hospital setting. And although she appeared to be quite quirky, she did appear to be sane. So yeah, I truly do. Maybe it was just an age thing. Maybe she it was just you know one of those things that young girls does. Um, young girls could do sorry, uh, so that that was quite good as well. And Georgina does her own thing. You don't you don't find out about a lot of these characters. A lot of these characters sort of disappear. Unfortunately, some of them commit suicide. Like Daisy, uh, she dies on her birthday uh, after she leaves the hospital. Um, so that that's bound to happen. But then you got other chapters in this book which are dedicated to the idea of mental health themselves. And there's this one called uh, suicide. So I'm going to read this out to you. Um, if if this does seem a bit uh, sensitive then by all means turn it off but I'm, I'm going to read this to you it's quite I, th I think it's quite a good chapter I'm just going to read the first page out to you okay so it's on page 36 in my edition and it's uh, three pages long but I'm just going to read the first page out to you suicide is a form of murder premeditated murder it isn't something you do the first time you think of doing it it takes getting used to and you need the means the opportunity the motive a successful suicide demands good organization and a cool head both of which are usually incompatible with the suicidal state of mind. It's important to cultivate detachment. One way to do this is to practice imagining yourself dead or in the process of dying. If there's a window, you must imagine your body falling out the window. If there's a knife, you must imagine the knife piercing your skin. If there's a train coming, you must imagine your torso flattening under its wheels. These exercises are necessary to achieve in the proper distance. The motive is paramount. Without a strong motive, you're sunk. My motives were weak. An American history paper I didn't want to write and the question I'd asked months earlier, why not kill myself? Dead. I wouldn't have to write the paper, nor would I have to keep debating this, the question. The debate was wearing me out. Once you've, posted them, that, once you've posted that question, it won't go away. I think many people kill themselves simply to stop the debate about whether they will or they won't. And I know some people will take issue to that, but um, I just thought it was a very fascinating insight into the whole idea of what goes on in, a, in with the suicidal process, with, with, what how people think about it. So there is there is some heavy stuff going on in this book. I mean, it, it's a, it's about a girl in a psychiatric hospital, so there's bound to be heavy stuff. But there's also there is light at the end of the tunnel for this book here. She does go on to leave it, lead a successful life. Obviously, um, when she went to, I think she was writing another book, and she um, had the idea of pub getting the files back from the hospital so she could publish it publish it she had to get i think she had to get a lawyer involved and yeah she got the files and she published it and it was a big success so she so good on her also pe peppered throughout the book are things like this like her initial you know uh, initial case record folder and uh, the pa paperwork that involved getting her signed off into the hospital so that this there's some good stuff going on here I do think it's a good read. I, I do think people should read it if they want to get an insight into this lifestyle, particularly through the mind of someone that's lived it. Uh, and I said before, and as I said before, it takes place during the counterculture movement. So there are talks of about the um, you know the assassinations that happened in the late sixties, about the Vietnam War. So there's some yeah. I think it's a good stuff. I think I think it's a good read. Yeah, very good read. I highly recommend it. Thanks very much for uh, watching. Um, yeah, if you like what you see, like, subscribe, uh, or comment below, and I'll get back to you. Thanks very much. See ya.